Grace and peace be unto all of you, certainly from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is Minister Ryan Perkins welcoming each and every one of you to Wednesday night Bible study. We certainly thank God for the wonderful opportunity that he has given to us uh, one more time uh, to gather together in his name around uh, the truth of the word of God. What a great privilege and honor it is uh, to be before you one more time, again, to preach and to teach the transformative, precious and powerful word of the living God. Tonight, we're going to continue our study uh, coming from 1 John chapter number two. And tonight we're going to be dealing with verses 15 all the way down to verse number 23. So if you have your Bibles, turn me, if you will, to 1 John chapter number two and then draw your attention to verse number 15. 1 John chapter number 2, uh, beginning at verse number 15. While we're turning to 1 John chapter number 2, beginning at verse number 15, we trust that each and every one of you has had a wonderful day in the Lord. We thank God for uh, him watching over each and every one of us. We thank him for, again, another opportunity to share with you the truth of the word of God. Uh, we have had a uh, couple weeks off, if you will, but during those weeks, we've had some dynamic times in the Lord. Uh, we certainly thank God for what took place uh, during those Wednesdays. We thank God for the time of refreshing, uh, time to recharge. But uh, I'm very delighted and excited to be back uh, to be before you again. And we thank God again for this wonderful opportunity. Um, we certainly want to continue to thank uh, our good friends at the intercessory prayer ministry. We thank God for their leadership. We thank God for their faithfulness. We thank God for their endurance, for their commitment in gathering together saints on a daily basis uh, to lift us up to the very throne of grace, the very th throne of God. We thank them once again for leading the way because you all know very, very well that if we're going to be everything that God intends us to be, we've got to be men and women of consistent and fervent prayer. And we thank God for, again, their leadership and their guidance and leading the way uh, with a wonderful example of a consistent and fervent prayer life. So I encourage you to follow their lead, follow them as they follow Christ uh, and be men and women of prayer. We certainly thank God for uh, the leadership of the church, we ask that you continue to pray for them uh, as they are leading and guiding us uh, in these last and evil days. We certainly want to remind each and every one of you to stay in your words on a personal level. We've got to expose ourselves to the word of God on a consistent basis. We thank God for your faithfulness in tuning in today. And certainly this is a great way to expose ourselves to the word of God Wednesday night Bible study. There are a myriad of things you could be doing right now, uh, but your faithfulness in this uh, is a testament to how God is continuing to uh, use you and continue to pour into you directly from his word. And again, we thank God and are excited about what we're going to be dealing with tonight. First John chapter number two. Again, I'll be reading your hearing uh, verses uh, 2, I'm sorry, chapter 2, verses 15, all the way down to verse number 23. We certainly thank God for uh, Deacon um, Roy Carswell. We thank God for how he is using him uh, during noonday Bible study. Uh, we ask that you continue to pray for him as well. First John chapter number 2, beginning at verse number seven, uh, 15. Hear the word of the Lord. The Bible declares, do not love the world or the things in the world. For if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world is three things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. These three things, John tell, tells us, is not of the Father but is of the world itself. Verse 17, and the world is certainly passing away and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God, watch this now, abides forever. Verse 18 tells us, little children, it is 
the last hour, the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists, plural, have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out, here it is, saints, from us, for it is they, for if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest known that none of them were of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and that no lie is contained or of the truth. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is an antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Listen very carefully. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Because again, when Jesus Christ says, I and my Father are one, he means business with that. God's word for God's people. Uh, may we bow in a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you now thanking you for this day, a day that we have never seen before, and a day, Father God, that we will never see again. We thank you, Father God, for the precious souls that have gathered here tonight, here at First Baptist Church Denby, by way of Facebook Live. And although we are separated, we are all together. We are coalescing around the truth of your word. And for that, Father God, we say thank you. We thank you for the opportunity uh, to study, Father God, from your word. And now to that end, Father God, we are praying for the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. That he may rest, rule, and abide in this setting, in every home, in every mind, in every heart. Open up, God, our understanding. And we may be able to clearly understand what the Spirit of the Lord is going to say tonight. We ask, Father God, that you would touch each and every individual that is on this uh, Facebook Live tonight. Continue to bless them, Father God, mightily. Have your way tonight. We thank you for what Christ did for us on the cross at Calvary, where he suffered, bled, and died some 2,000 years ago. He was buried, but he rose again the third day with all power and authority in his hand. And for that, Father God, we say thank you. We love you on the day because you first loved us. We ask all these things in the matchless and powerful name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And all of God's children say, Amen and Amen. We had to pin a topic uh, to our uh, Bible study tonight. Uh, it would be, do not love the world. Do not love the world. Beginning in verse number 15, John tells us uh, exactly that. He says, do not love the world or the things that are in the world. Now, previously, uh, we have been dealing with this great book, and John has told us and has talked to us a lot about love. First of all, love for God himself, and then loving our neighbor as ourselves, loving one another just as Christ has loved us. So previously, John has talked about how we should love and who we should love. But beginning in verse number 15 of chapter number 2, John tells us what we are not to love. And he tells us very clearly that we are not to love the world or the things of the world. In order for us to clearly understand what John is referring to, we have to define and clearly define what the word world is. So what is John referring to, to when he uses the word world? Well, he's not referring to the physical world. Uh, he's not referring to nature, but what he is referring to is the evil system of the world, the evil system of the world. The world, the Bible tells us, lies in the lap of the evil one. The evil one here is none other than Satan himself. Uh, the world uh, is a collection of evil systems that are dominated and controlled by Satan and the forces of evil. So as true believers, you and I are not to love the world, nor are we to um, adhere to the things of the world. John tells us we're not to love the world, 
nor are we to love the things that are in the world. Now listen to what he says here in the B clause of verse number 15. He says, if anyone loves the world, that is the world's evil system that is controlled and dominated by Satan and the forces of evil, the Bible says the love of, and that word should be for the father is not in him. If you have someone that loves the world, uh, that is conformed to the world, the love of and for the father is not in that individual. The reason being is the love of God and the love of the world, they are diametrically opposed. They are polar opposites. Jesus Christ said it this way, you cannot love God and mammon. He said it, he went further and said, no man can serve two masters. So we cannot have love for the world by simultaneously having love for the father. Uh, there is a choice that needs to be made. And like with Christ, when he says you're either with me or, or you're against me, there is no middle ground here. Again, you can't love the world and simultaneously have love for God. Because the Bible says, if you love me, you're going to do what you're going to keep my commandments. So John tells us, underneath the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we're not to love the world's evil system. Rather, we are to love God and our demonstration for the love of God is by being obedient to him. And notice what John says in verse number 16. Now he begins to tell us what is in the world. Remember now in verse 15, he says, don't love the world or the things that are in or of the world. In verse number 16, he defines for us the things of the world. And it boils, it boils down into three categories. John says, for all that is in the world, that is the world's evil system, again, dominated by Satan and the forces of evil. The first one is the lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh. Second is the lust of the eyes. And the third is the pride of life. In two of the three categories that John breaks down for us here in verse 16, the word lust is used. Lust in this connotation is a, a evil or sinful desire or longing. Lust is a evil uh, desire or longing. So when, he, when, when John says that, we, that all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh. So again, lust is an evil desire or a longing. Flesh here, it talks about the depraved nature of mankind, right? All of us are born with an evil nature. We're born with a depraved, sinful nature. So what John says is, uh, the world's evil system begins with the evil desires, the evil longings of the sinful nature of mankind. And what Satan and the forces of evil do is they are looking to incite. They are looking to arouse the evil desires of what? Of our flesh. Because the Bible tells us that in our flesh dwells no good thing. So Satan is trying to arouse, he's trying to excite, and he's trying to incite the evil desires that are inside of us in our flesh. This is why the Bible tells us that daily you and I have got to mortify, that word simply means to kill, the flesh on a daily basis. Because again, this is how Satan attacks us. He attacks us by arousing the evil desires that we already have in our flesh. So we want to beat the flesh, Paul says, into submission so that we are in control of our flesh as opposed to our flesh being in control of us. So the first thing that is a part of the world's evil system is the evil, sinful desires of our flesh. And again, in our flesh dwells no good thing. Now notice the second one here. The second one here is the, the lust or the evil desires of the eye gate. The evil desires of the eye gate. Satan and the forces of, of, of evil, they utilize the eye gate. Uh, I'll also add to that the ear gate. And basically it is anything that is that we receive inside of us. Uh, movies, uh, music, uh, videos, whatever it may be. 
Satan and the forces of, of evil utilize the eye gate, right, again, to inflame, to incite, and to arise, arouse evil desires, evil desires. The lust of the eyes or the lust of the eye gate is closely re related to the sin of covetousness. Uh, covetousness means, uh, in part, we're looking at something, watch this now, saints, that we have no right to. Uh, we're desiring something that we already have enough of. This is the sin of covetousness. And the lust of the eyes, the eye gate, is closely related to the sin of covetousness. This is why David says, I'm going to have a covenant with God and my eyes. That I'm not going to look on something, right, that is going to incite or arouse a sinful desire inside of me. In other words, saints, you and I have to guard what we're looking at. We've got to guard what we are watching. We've got to guard the intake of content that comes on the inside of us. Yeah, Satan uses the eye gate, right, mixed in and a part of the world's evil system. Now, let's begin to build on that. And I want to take you to two passages of scripture that's going to help us understand this idea of the lust of the flesh and how it is closely re related to the sin of covetousness, desiring something that we have no right to. The first one is, let's go to the Old Testament book of Joshua. Joshua chapter number seven. Joshua chapter number seven. Now, as we turn to Joshua chapter number seven, and when you find Joshua seven, draw your attention to verse number 20. God has uh, given the nation of Israel a command that when they go into the land and when they battle for the land, when they defeat those individuals that are in the land, those people, groups, those nations that are in the land, in this instance, God says, do not take any spoils, right? Do not take anything that is valuable. You're to, you're to utterly destroy them and don't take anything of wealth, all right? Now, this is the command of God that God gave by way of Joshua to the nation of Israel. You had an individual by the name of Achan uh, that disobeyed God's command. And as, a, and as a consequence, there was sin in the camp of Israel. And as a consequence of that, when Israel went to battle, they were defeated because there was sin in the camp. There was rebellion in the camp by way of Achan and his family. Now, when this was discovered that Achan had stolen, Achan had rebelled against the command of God and had, and had taken some material goods, some material wealth from the nation by which God told them not to do. And now Achan has been exposed. Now notice what Achan, notice what Achan says in verse number 20, because Joshua uh, confronted Achan about his rebellion and disobedience to what God had commanded them to do. Notice what Achan says in verse number 20, Joshua chapter 7, verse 20. The Bible says, and Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned, watch this now, saints, against the Lord God of Israel. And this is what I have done. Here it is now, saints. When I saw, that is the beginnings of the lust of the flesh, the sinful desires, of, I'm sorry, sinful desires of the eyes, the eye gate. Achan said, when I saw, listen now, among the spoils, a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver, a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels. What, is, what does the Bible say? I coveted after them and took them. So you have the lust of the eye gate coupled with covetousness because he coveted those things which he had no right to. Because God gave explicit instructions to say, you're to take nothing. It can solve them. It, in, it aroused a evil desire in him, the evil desire of covetousness. He said, he saw these things and I took them. And notice what he says here. And there 
they are hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent with the silver under it. And then Joshua, of course, if you know the story, uh, had to deal with the sin in the camp. And Achan and his entire family were stoned, uh, 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 his, his entire family, because the entire family was in cahoots with Achan because it, they hid it, as it were, in the house. But this is how uh, uh, Satan works. He, he, he gets us to see things, right, and then covet those things, which God says, you know what, you have to touch those things. Looking at things and desiring things we have no right to. Let's go a little bit further. Now let's go to the New Testament gospel record of Matthew, the gospel according to Matthew. And when you find the gospel according to Matthew, I want you to draw your attention to verse number, uh, chapter number five. Matthew chapter number five. And then when you find Matthew chapter number five, I want to draw your attention to verse number 27. Matthew chapter five. And we're going to begin reading in verse number 27. This, of course, is a part of the Sermon on the Mount that our Lord gave, recorded for us in the Gospel according to Matthew in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Notice what he says here in Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse number 7. Remember, John says, what is consistent in the world is not only the lust of the flesh, but also the lust of the eyes. Notice what Christ says here. You have heard that it said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whoever, here it is, saints, looks, that's the eye gate, at a woman or a man to lust after her has already committed adultery with her where in his heart. So what, is, what, what the picture is here is via the lust of the eyes, the eye gate, you have someone looking upon an individual that does not belong to them. If you're married, look on your wife. If you're married, look upon your husband. If you're not married, you're not to look upon anybody of the opposite sex in a sinful way. Because the Bible says when you do that, you have already committed adultery in your heart. If you're looking at someone that's single, you've already committed fornication in your heart. Now notice what Jesus Christ says. If your right eye, talking about the eye gate, if your right eye causes you to sin, Jesus Christ says, pluck it out, gouge it out, and cast it from you, for it is more profitable that, that one of your members perish than your whole body be cast into what? Into hell's fire. What is Christ talking about? He's not literally talking about taking a knife and cutting one of your eyes out. The point that Christ is making here is you and I have got to take drastic measures to do two things, to prevent us from sinning and to stop us from sinning. And this is the point that Christ is making. We've got to take all measures necessary to prevent us from sinning, again, flee from even the very appearance of evil, and if we are caught up in a sin, we've got to take drastic measures to repent of that sin. So you and I, like David, we've got to have a covenant with God and our eyes that we're not going to look on anything that will cause us to do what? That will cause us to sin. Oh, and Satan and the force of evil, they don't make it, they don't make it easy on us. This is something that we've got to do actively. Something we've got to do actively. Now let's rush back uh, over to John, 1 John chapter number 2. So he tells us here that, uh, first of all, we have the sinful desire uh, of the flesh. Then we have the sinful desires of the eye gate. And then he talks about the third one here is, and the pride of life, the pride of life. This, of course, is the sin of pride. And really, uh, this is a, a situation where you have someone that is arrogant. You have someone that is prideful because of their situation. Uh, and what they do is uh, they begin to brag about their situation. And oftentimes uh, when they brag, uh, they add a little extra to it. So you, uh, not only do you have the sin of pride, 
you also have the sin of lying because you're doing what? You're exaggerating things. Uh, this is someone, again, that is braggadocious. That's why uh, in some translations and certainly in some commentaries, it is the boastful brag uh, uh, pride of life, right? Because this is someone that is bragging and boasting about their situation. Not giving God any credit for uh, their blessings, uh, but giving themselves credit for it. And then trying to make themselves look bigger and better uh, than what they really are. This is what uh, John talks about, the pride of life. Pride, the Bible tells us, it comes before a fall. It comes before destruction. Pride is a sin. And the Bible tells us that we are to humble ourselves under the mighty hand, hand meaning authority of God. And in due season, he's going to lift us up. You see, you and I are going to be humble. We're going to be humble. Uh, the issue is uh, uh, who's going to be doing the humbling. Because the Bible, God graciously allows us to humble ourselves. <laughs> uh, and I would encourage you to take advantage of that. Uh, because we don't want God to humble us. Uh, oh yeah, that, that's a painful uh, uh, situation. Uh, to the Bible, uh, uh, God gives us the opportunity to humble ourselves under the authority of God. Uh, and don't worry about being lifted up. God will take care of that in his own way, in his own timing. Uh, what we want to do is we want to be humble before God, humble before him. So these three things is how Satan and the forces of evil attack us within the world's evil system. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and of course the, the, the braggadocious pride of life. Notice what John says of these three. Of these three, he says, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Uh, these three things are not connected to the Father. The Father rebuff and resists these things, but they are embedded in the world. Now listen very carefully. When you and I consistently engage in these things, what we are doing is we are conforming to the evil system of the world, a system that is dominated and controlled by Satan himself. And the Bible clearly tells us that we are not to be conformed to the world. We're not to be bought into the things of the world, but rather we are to be transformed by the refreshing, the renewing, what of our minds of our minds this is why john tells us that we are not to love the world nor are we to love the things of the world because these things are separate from the father you cannot love the world and god at the same time and god tells us this is how satan attacks us again we are to be cognitive uh, uh, paul tells us of the wiles of the devil we talked about that a couple Sundays ago. Uh, the wiles of the devil, the trickery, the deception, the schemes of the devil. And these are the three ways that Satan and the forces of evil try to get us to conform to the world. And the Bible is very, very clear that we are to be separate from the world. Come out from among them. And I don't mean that, that, that you, you buy a plot of land in the boondocks. No, no. Come out from among them simply means we're not conforming to them. We don't buy into the world's evil system. We don't do that. From a practical standpoint, notice what John says in verse number 17. He says, the world is what is passing away and the evil desires or the lust of it. You see that? The, the world and the evil system of the world, they're passing away. Peter tells us that they're going to be burned up with fervent heat down to the elementary level, protons, neutrons, the world's evil system is going to be burned up in the fire of judgment. Why would we want to be associated with something that's going to be utterly and completely destroyed? Yeah, the, the world, John says, is passing away and the lust of it. Here it is now, saints, but he who does the will of God, here it is, they abide forever. 
This is talking about eternality. Talk about eternity. The evil system of the world is going to be utterly destroyed. It's going to be wiped away for all of eternity. You see that? But the Bible says that those that do the will of God on a consistent basis, here it is, abides forever. Yeah, I like that word abide. Uh, this talks about uh, the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. Uh, we persevere, we endure, the Bible says, until the end. And we do that by the empowerment of the Holy Ghost. And we're going to deal with him a little bit later in our time. But the, the, the point here is, as Christians, we've got to do what? We've got to abide, right, in Christ. He says, he who does the will of God, what they abide forever. So we don't, we don't uh, conform to the evil system of the world. That is passing away. But what we do is we endure and we abide, the Bible tells us, in the very will of God. In the very will of God. Now notice what it says here in verse number 18. Little children. Little children. This is a, a term of endearment. Uh, John is writing from a pastoral perspective. Uh, he says, little children. He says, it is the last hour. It's the last hour. This again, uh, the last hour is what we call, again, a dispensation. It's a period of time. And the period of time you and I are living in the last hour or the last days. Uh, this is a dispensation, a period of time that between the first and second advent of Christ, we're in this period right now. We are living in the last hour. We're living in the last days. And John wants to tell us what's going to be happening in this dispensation. What is going on in this period of time? Tell us, John. And, and as you have heard that the Antichrist, singular, Antichrist is coming, is coming in the future, even now in the present, you have many Antichrists plural, have what? Have come. This is the first time in the whole of the Holy Writ where the word Antichrist is located. In fact, the word Antichrist is only located in the uh, writings, the inspired writings of John the Apostle. Uh, you, found, you find them in his epistles and you certainly find it in the revelation of Jesus Christ. The first Antichrist, the singular Antichrist, that John is referring to uh, is detailed uh, very much so in the book of Revelation. This is someone that is going to uh, rebuff God, someone that's going to rebuff Christ. He is part of the unholy trinity. Yeah, part of the unholy trinity. Uh, he, is going, he is going to be an individual, a, a, a live individual that is going to set up a reign and a rule right here on the earth. Uh, prayerful of, of thankfully you and I will be in heaven during this time because all this is going to take place during the great tribulation period that seven year period that's instituted or begins after the rapture of the church this individual uh, uh, his operation he may be alive today but this individual is not in operation right now uh, but what is in operation right now are these little antichrists, if you will. <laughs> yeah, they're all over the place. Yeah, they're all over the place. And they are very active in this period of time. They're very active in June of 2021. Paul, uh, uh, John tells us that even now many antichrists have come. And by this, John tells us, we know that we are in the last hour. We're in the last days. Now notice what he says here in verse number 19. He says, um, they went out. Okay, so first of all, who are the they? The they are these antichrists. Notice, saints, their origin. Notice where they come from. John says, they went out from us. We've already defined who the they is. The thus is, the, the us is the body of Christ. John said they came out from among us. But John tells us they were not of us. So this is 
a classic example of the wheat and the tares. And Christ tells us that the wheat is going to grow, uh, the, 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 the tares is going to grow right up with the wheat. You see that? They went out from us, but they were not of us. You see that? Uh, they may have talked like us. They may have went to Bible study. They may have been a part of some type of ministry, but they were not a part of the body of Christ. In other words, they were charlatans. They weren't true believers. They did not have a genuine relationship with God through Jesus Christ. They were among us, right? But they went out from us, Paul, uh, J John tells us. He says, for if they had been of us, they would have, here it is, saints, continued. Then here John, again, is talking about the, again, the perseverance of the saints. They, the saints continue in Christ. Abide, Christ says, in me. You got to get connected to me. For if they had been of us, they would have continued or remained with us. Here it is. But they went out that they may be made manifest, known that they were never a part of us. They were never a part of us. And again, this talks about the perseverance of the saints. Christ talks about it in the parable of the sower. And he says that uh, you have uh, uh, the, the, the folk that uh, they, the seed, it, it, it fell on the soil and it sprung up a little root. But Christ said because of the tribulations of life, because of the persecution of the church, the true body of Christ, they what? They left because they were not truly um, of us. They did not have a genuine relationship with God through Jesus Christ. You and I as Christians, we've got to persevere. We've got to endure. We've got to have long suffering because in this Christian walk, if you and I are living as Christ lived, thinking as Christ thought, speaking as Christ spoke, you and I are going to be persecuted. We're going to go through some things that we would not have gone through if we were not saved. We are suffering, as it were, for the cause of Christ. And in that, you and I have got to endure We've got to persevere, persevere, and we've got to remain steadfast. Steadfast. Now, notice, now look, look at this now. Let's go over to underscore this point. Let's go over to the gospel according to Mark, Mark chapter number 13. John says that they came from us, right? But he also says they were never really a part of us. Their relationship to the body of Christ was fake it was phony and it was superficial and the fact that they left they did not persevere they did not endure is a clear john says manifestation that they were never a part of us john is building something here saying so we got to follow what he's saying here to underscore this we're going over to mark chapter 13 verse 13 mark 13 13 notice what it says here Mark 13, 13. Oh, yes. <laughs> Notice what Jesus Christ says. Mark 13, 13. He says, and you will be hated. Why, Lord? For by all, for my namesake. Doing that which I have called you to do for my glory. You're going to be hated. Hear, hear what it says here. But he. Who, what does Mark say? Endures, perseveres, has what Dr. King said, staying power. You're not going anywhere. You're persevering, you're enduring, you, are, you have long suffering. He says, but he who endures to the end is going to be saved, is going to be what? Is going to be delivered. You see that? And a tall tale sign of a fake, phony, so-called Christian is that when persecution comes up, they do what? They flee. Because they don't really believe it anyway. No one is going to be persecuted, right, for something they truly don't believe in. They're not going to, they're, they're, they're going to run away. And this is the, this is a part 
of what John is referring to. Now let's go a little bit deeper. Let's go a little bit deeper. We're going back to John, chap, 1 John chapter number 2. Notice what he says here, saints. He says here, verse 19, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued, remained, persevered with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest or known that none of them were of us. Now notice what he says in verse number 20. He says, but you have an anointing. Mm -mm -mm -mm. You have an anointing. Anointing in this particular context is you have an empowerment. God empowers us for a specific task. That's what the word anointing means, both in the Old and the New Testament. Anointing is the empowerment of God for a specific purpose. Jane, John tells us, those of us that abide in Christ, remain, we have an anointing. We have been empowered. Where did the anointing come from? Where did it come from? Not the source, if you will, of the anointing, because it comes from and the source is for the same thing. But John makes a dichotomy here. He says, the anointing, good God of mercy, it comes from the Holy One. <laughs> That's none other than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He anoints us. You see that? Now he says, and you all, and you know all things. All things talks about the truth of the word of God. You know all things. So Christ tells us in the gospel record, I've got to go. He tells us, I've, I've got to go. And as a consequence of, the, of me having to go, don't let your heart be troubled. You believe, already believe in God, believe also in me. And when I leave, <laughs> I'm going to leave you a comforter. Yeah, I'm going to leave you a comforter. Someone that has the same nature and the same essence as me. And that comforter is none other than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, Lord, uh, the, the comforter itself is, comes from Christ, but the comfort is none other than the Holy Spirit of God. What did Christ say that the Holy Spirit of God is going to do? He is going to lead and guide us into all truth. All truth. And this is what John says, but you have been anointed from Christ and you know all things, all biblical truth is going to be explained to us and illuminated by the Holy Spirit of God. This is what he says in verse number 21. Have I not written to you? I have not written to you because you do not know the truth. You see, the things of God, they're spiritually discerned, Paul tells us. They're spiritually discerned. To the unregenerate mind, Paul tells us they, these things are foolishness. The only way we can deeply understand the things of God, the only way these things can be applied to our everyday life is that the Holy Ghost has got to open up our understanding. And it's that same power, that same anointing that allows us to live out what he is explaining to us. We've got to have the Holy Ghost. And Christ has given us the Holy Ghost and what a precious gift it is. He is going to lead and guide us into all biblical truth. And, and then he's going to empower us to live out that biblical truth. I'm not writing to you because you don't know the truth. Oh, yeah. But because you know it. See that? And that no lie is what is of the truth. There is no lies contained in the truth. Because if it were, it automatically becomes untrue. This is unadulterated truth of the word of God. The veracity of the word of God. The inerrancy of the word of God. In its original footprint. Notice what he says here now. Verse 21. It talks about us knowing the truth. 
based from, on the anointing that Christ gave via the Holy Ghost that opens up our understanding and allows us, empowers us to do what he is expounding in our minds. Now notice what it says here. But who is a liar? Who's a liar? But he that denies that Jesus is the Christ. Here it is, saints. Here it is, saints. He says, I'm writing to you not because you don't know the truth, but you actually know the truth, and there is no lie embedded in the truth or within the truth. What John is talking about here is heresy, something that is heretical. Now, we got to take a little bit of time on this. In the Bible, well, you have heresy and you have error. Heresy and error. There's a difference between the two. Let's begin to break this down. In error, you have some people uh, that there's a debate in the New Testament church that says, you know what? Uh, we should not be tithing anymore. We should uh, only give free will offering. Then you have some that say, no, we should tithe and give free will offering. Right? Whatever side that you're on, the Bible says that we, as a man purposes his heart, so let him give. But the Bible also says that we're to do what? We're to tithe. That is what? An error. The difference between an error and heresy is that if a person says, you know what? I don't believe in tithing. All I'm going to do is free will give. You're not going to hell behind that. Maybe an error, but it won't cause you to die and go to hell. Heresy are false doctrines that attack. Here it is. The nature of God, the nature of Christ, and the nature of salvation. Now, if we get those three things wrong, one of, the, of those three, that it means that we're what? We're outside the ark of safety. So you have error and you have heresy. The lies here that John is referring to is heresy. You know that because he asked the question, who is a liar? The one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. The Bible says we've got to believe both in the person, that is everything the Bible reveals about Christ, and also his redemptive work, his death, burial, and resurrection. When you start fooling around with Christology, what the Bible reveals about Christ, you're in trouble. You say, well, uh, why do I got to believe that, that, that Christ uh, was born of a virgin? The reason why you got to believe that Christ is born of a virgin is because if Christ was born like any other man, that means he was born with a sin nature. If he was born with a sin nature, that means he sinned. If he sinned, God did not accept his sacrifice on the cross at Calvary. Christ, if he sinned, could not be the lamb of God, right? The sacrifice of God that came to take away the sins of the world because the Bible tells us both in the Old and the New Testament that God wants a lamb without spot or wrinkle. So when Christ was born of the Holy Ghost, born of a virgin, that means that he had the nature of God, is God, lived a perfect life, uniquely positioning him to be the lamb of God, the sacrifice of God that takes away the sins of the world. When you start fooling with Christ and the nature of God and the nature of salvation, you're in trouble. Now you're dealing with heretical things, heresies, heresies. Now, we don't want any errors. Uh, another one I can give you an example of an error is this. Some people say, well, you know what? Uh, in baptism, you can sprinkle folk or you can pour water over their head. That's an error. Because the Bible is very, very clear that we are, should be immersed. We go down in water as Christ did. But that's not going to send you to hell. But when you start fooling around with the nature of Christ. This is why John says, who is a liar, but he who denies that Jesus is the anointed one, the Christ. The anointed one is the chosen one of God, the Messiah to the Jew, the chosen one of God, uniquely positioned to be the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And what these false preachers and teachers were doing is, they were saying that, Christ, that Jesus of Nazareth is not the Christ. 
He was a good man, walked around, did a lot of miracles. Same shenanigans that folk are saying now. But John says, once anyone that denies Jesus is the anointed one, he is an antichrist. Who denies the father and the son. Because when you deny God, you deny the son because the Bible says, Jesus said of himself, I and the father are one. I had a guy, I heard a guy on, on television say, well, you know what? Uh, I certainly, uh, I, I love Jesus, but I got a problem with God. Say what? The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is the very image of God, the express image of God bodily. Jesus, that's why Jesus Christ said, when you have seen me, you have seen the Father. You see that? So John tells us here, he is an antichrist who denies the father and the son. Because when you deny the son, you deny the father. When you deny the father, you deny the son because they, they, they are one and the same. Same essence and same nature. Very quickly, saints, listen to this real, real quickly. If you want to know whether or not a religion is a false religion, an heretical religion, ask what is their theology about Christ. Years ago, I was working or about to begin to work in the yard with my father. Jehovah Witness comes up. Hey, can, can we talk to you guys? And, and uh, my dad said, sure, yeah, you, you can talk to us. They, they were going on and, and, and uh, telling us this, telling us that. My father politely interrupted him and said, what do you believe about Christ? Oh, well, you know, well, you know, we believe that he was a good prophet and uh, he was a, a wise man. No, no, no. That, that's not what the Bible says of him. Do you believe that he was God in the flesh? Well, no, he won't God now. Her heresy. Because the Bible clearly says that Christ was what? God in the flesh. When they left, uh, my father sat me down and said, son, if you want to know whether or not a religion is false, find out what they believe about Christ. Find out what they believe about. When you start messing around with Christ of the Bible, that's why you hear me say the God of the Bible, not some God that you have dropped up in your head. No, the God of the Bible, what God reveals about himself, same thing with Christ. What does the Bible reveal about Christ? When we start tinkling with that, the Bible says we are, those folk are what? They're antichrist. And John here just gives one example that these guys are going around saying that Jesus was not the Christ. And when you do that, he says, they deny the Father and the Son. Now notice what John says in verse number 23, then we're done. Whosoever, we've already made this point, whosoever denies the Son, you don't have the Father. He who acknowledges the Son, again, saints, Believe everything the Bible reveals about Christ, including his redemptive work, his death, burial, and resurrection. Watch this now. Has the Father also. Because again, they are one and the same in essence and in nature. So next time the Jehovah Witness, the Mormons, because they like to come at your door as well, ask them, what do you believe about Christ? And they deny anything about what the word of God says about Christ, you know that this is a doctrine of demons. We got to talk straight. Because when you start talking and attacking salvation, oh, Jesus Christ was just a man. He's a way of salvation. No, he is definite article, the way, the truth, the life. That's a definite article in Greek. The way, the truth, the life. And anybody that subscribes to anything outside of what the Bible reveals about Christ John says, underneath the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, you are what? A antichrist. And we want to run away from them. And we certainly do not want to subscribe to what they're teaching about Christ. Our time is up, saints. Oh, yes. Uh, we thank God uh, for the word that went forth tonight. We pray and trust uh, that it was a blessing and a benediction to you all. I, I pray and ask uh, that you would uh, go over this uh, post again with your Bible, because these are some serious things that we need to make sure we have 
uh, a clear understanding in our hearts and in our minds. As always, I never want to end uh, our Bible study because we don't know who is watching. We never want to end our Bible study without uh, presenting Christ to you. Paul says, I'm determined to know nothing among you, but Christ and him crucified. Uh, the Bible is very, very clear that Christ came into the world to save sinners. A sinner is someone that does, thinks, and says things against the very standard of God. In fact, the Bible says we all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory, the standard of God. Uh, the bad news about that is that the wages or the consequence of your sin and mine is death, separation from God for all of eternity. The good news is that Jesus Christ, over 2,000 years ago, died a substitutionary death, an atoning death, a satisfying death for your sin and for mine. And when we place saving faith in his person, all that the Bible reveals about him and his redemptive work is death, burial, and resurrection. The Bible says, old things have now passed away and behold, all things are now become new. I present Christ to you today. Because the Bible says today is a day of salvation. Tomorrow is not promised to us. You say, Reverend Perkins, I'm already saved. Uh, but you're going to need a church home. I'm looking for a church home. I present to you First Baptist Church, Denby. Uh, we are a church that's striving to be a church without spot or wrinkle. We are desiring and God is doing this, using us in these last and evil days that we talked about during our time together. The church has all the spiritual resources that you and your family need to work out your soul salvation and fear and trembling, to walk in the unique divine purpose and destiny God has for you and your family. Today, I present to you First Baptist Church. Demi, we would love to have you. Well, saints, again, our, our time is well spent. And what a privilege it has to be. It has been to come before you one more time. I thank God for all of you. Uh, that have joined us this evening. Uh, and we thank God for each and every one of you. Let us pray uh, and close out our time together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you now to say thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the working and the gifting of the Holy Spirit. He empowers us to be able to understand the truth of, the, of your word. And then that same power helps us, Father God, to work these things out in our lives on a consistent basis. We thank you for that good and perfect gift that comes down from the Father of lights in the Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of us. God, you are very clear, you always are, that we are to not to conform, Father God, to this world. Help us, Father God, to battle within us the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. Mm -hmm that we would not conform to these things, but that we would rebuff them in the power and the matchless name of Jesus the Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. Help us, Father God, to, be, to make a difference in terms of our everyday lives, that we, Father God, will allow folk to see our good works and glorify our, our Father, which is in heaven. We thank you for every individual that's on uh, this Facebook posting tonight. Continue to bless them richly. We'll be careful to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. And we ask all these things in Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen. Again, we certainly thank God for each and every one of you. I see uh, uh, TJ Cook. God bless you, sir. Thank you for joining in. Tell Chris Ann we said we love her. Uh, Sue Witherspoon, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. I know you had a birthday recently. Sister George, God bless you. Tell your husband I love him. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Sister Harris, I see you. Deegan and Deegan Taylor, I see you. Uh, Deegan Smith, I see you as well. Laura, I see you. God bless each and every one of you. We hope that you will be right here, God willing, next week. Or, or uh, Yes, next week, this coming Sunday, for our 10 o'clock worship service. Uh, and we, we, we trust you'll be right here. God bless each and every one of you. Uh, and God, we're praying that God will keep you until we meet next time this week. God bless you.